Look, what is your... Let's try and answer the question that Alex just posed. What is your outlook for copper, and do you think the Chinese, if they do lean in on the rally that we've seen, will have much impact? Well, there, there's a difference between short-term impacts and long-term impacts. The copper business is a very long-term business. I mean, investments require long periods of time, demand emergency emerges in a long-term way. In the short run, actions can have an impact. Uh, commodity trading can have an impact. But the commodity market for copper today is extraordinarily strong. It's both on the demand side, we've got new sources of demand that you've been talking about, and, and supply scarcity is a real factor in the marketplace. Well, let's get to that supply uh, scarcity, because, uh, Richard, in some industries like oil, it's become much more short cycle with the evolution of new technology and shale. Can you explain to us why that isn't happening in the copper market? Well, I like, like to say there's no shale oil for copper. Um, the, uh, and, and we watch for technology changes. Uh, we just had Bob Dudley to our board from uh, Tide CEO of BP, and he was comparing the differences for our board between copper and oil. Today, the top 10 copper producers in, in uh, the top 10 copper producers in 2021, top 10, the most recent discoveries was our Grassberg mine in the late 80s. There was one other mine in the early 80s. The last most recent discovery was 50 years ago. So unlike the oil industry where you have an ongoing flow of discoveries and now the new element of shale coming in, copper mines of size, and these 10 mines produce almost 25% of the world's copper, are very rare to find. Grays are falling. Uh, in existing mines, newer mines that have the possibility of being developed are much lower quality in terms of, of yep. grades and their location. So it's a wholly, it's hard to find another commodity that has a supply side support that copper has. And now we've got a new era of copper demand where we're not just relying on China's growth for new demand, but lots of things for growth outside China. Richard, let's just talk a little bit about substitution and demand destruction. If prices get too high, like copper's great at conducting, but you can use aluminium, aluminum as well. Do you think if prices get to the point uh, much further than where they are now, we're going to see significant substitution? My view is demand's going to be so strong, supplies of copper are going to be limited, that substitution will be required. It, it, scrap will be, have, to, have to emerge to fill the gap. People have been talking about substitution for copper for 30 years, but copper has such strong advantages physically in conducting electricity that it creates a real barrier to substitution. But with this coming gap that we're going to have between demand and supply, the world's going to have to find ways to substitute just, just, just to operate. And but when that happens, it's going to be in the context of a very, very strong copper price. Richard, how long do you think that supply gap is going to last? So the two ways that I, I, I'm thinking about it, um, one is that ESG higher input costs, higher taxes in certain countries like Chile and Peru are going to dramatically raise the cost curve, so therefore you're not going to get a lot of supply. The other is that everyone's going to go mine bananas because they want to take advantage of ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 copper, and we're going to end up with a more deflationary scenario. Which one are you thinking is going to play out? The problem with the second point you made, that supply is going to emerge because in the near term because of high prices, it, it can't happen in our industry. Uh, this began, really, the supply challenge began in the early 2000s when China emerged. And since then, mining companies have gotten to be very large, well capitalized, technically strong, and have had a focus on trying to develop new copper supplies. And they just haven't been able to do it. We've got a new world today with all the, with, 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 with carbon reduction, uh, 
things outside China creating growth. I believe our company has the best portfolio of undeveloped research, resources, reserves and resources. They're brownfield opportunities yep. with our minds. And if the price of copper were to double today, we would not have significant new production for five years or more. Wow. Richard, um, governments around the world are looking at this. And while shareholders are reporting companies fiscal discipline and the fact that they haven't been out and spent this cycle, and that seems to be the new watchword. Governments don't play by the same rules. They're going to want their tax take. Do you expect the copper miners are going to have to pay significantly higher taxes in the environment you're describing? Government aspirations for revenues, workers' aspirations for revenues are all correlated to the copper price. And, and so, uh, to start with, um, we've always had a philosophy of making sure that governments and communities have a fair deal in, in our operations. And, um, and, and in most cases, they get 50% or more of the revenues, or 40 to 50%. Um, so that's going to be a factor. And what, what's so tempting for governments is, and I've talked about our business being long term, we make these investments in developing new mines. And then we have decades of production afterwards. Governments try to attract us to make the investments by offering mm -hmm. uh, attractive terms. Once those investments are made and revenues start flowing, prices go up. Governments see that as a source of revenues. This is not a new factor. It's things we've had to deal with over our history. But in today's world, it's a real factor. Richard, before I let you go, I could talk to you for hours. But before I let you go, um, the same reason that we have a supply shortage in copper could also affect you on the input side, whether it's freight or labor or oil or steel or whatever. What are you noticing on the ground right now that you just can't get a hold of? Well, we've got a hold of it, Alex. I mean, we, we've been in this business a long time. We've got a real strong supply chain organization. We operate every mine we have an interest in. So in the Americas, we run all of our Americas mines as one business. We have this big mine in Indonesia. So we, and for many of our suppliers, we're their largest customer. And so we, we certainly have our arms around it. Some of our costs are correlated to the copper price. You know, energy is 20% or so of our costs. Labor costs rise. Uh, input costs, some input costs rise. But the great thing about our business is our margins are expanding. You know, really? costs go up, but our margins are expanding because copper is mm. right at the top of the list of the commodities that's, that, that's rising so much. And for, and I know we don't have time, but there's a lot of company specific things that are going well for Freeport. We've had a long journey to get where we are here today, but man, we're, we're, we're really set up now. Our Indonesia mine is being expanded. Volumes are yep. rising, costs are going down. We're moving underground at a scale that's never been done before in the, in, in the history of the industry. We're applying technology to reduce costs and increase volumes. In the Americas, we're looking at some new leaching technology that could be very important for us. Hmm. I've, I've been in this business a long time. Ten yep. years ago, our company was in a similar situation. I've never felt better about where our company is, is right now and where the markets are that we, we, we sell products into.